கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste and welcome to uh, the final, final <laughs> installment of this series of Ananya Bhakti. I want to share with you something that's very powerful and I hope you'll watch all the way through because I'm the type of person I like to save the best for last. <laughs> It's in my chart. I can't help myself. <laughs> Like, now I'm 70 years old and I feel better than I ever have in my whole life. <laughs> so, let's uh, go to what I want to talk about, which is the temple of the self. Each of us is the high priest of our own religion. And what is that religion? Religion. the natural religion, the universal religion of worship of the self, isn't it? We all love ourself more than anything or anyone else. And that's okay. It's just that <laughs> in most cases, people mistake the ego for the self or the body or the mind. That's a mistake. Why is it a mistake? Because it doesn't bring us to full satisfaction. Now, what is religion, really? Religion is love. And what is love? As my Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, always said, love means service. Service. If I love you, I serve you. If I love myself, I serve myself. Huh? But what is really the self? The self is nothing but pure awareness. Pure consciousness. So, in religion, in a temple... especially. What are we doing in the temple? We're offering things to God, isn't it? Now, of course, in a Christian temple, there is no deity as such. There's maybe a symbol of a deity in the shape of a cross. Or in a Muslim temple, Islamic temple, there is no even image or symbol of God, but God is there as an idea. The controller, the creator, the owner of everything and everyone. Well, that's okay. Well, what is the actual owner of everything? <laughs> what is the actual creator of everything? Our consciousness. So in a Hindu temple or Vedic temple, There is the controller and creator in the form of the deity. Now, of course, there are many, many different forms, many different names of God. But that's just a detail. The principle is the important thing. And the principle is always that God is the creator and controller of the whole universe In other words, our entire experience, whatever it is that we can experience, is owned and controlled by God. Isn't that the idea? So what else can God be other than consciousness? Because everything that we experience, everything we can have, everything we can do, everything we can think of or imagine, is within the universe, and the universe is created by God. 
So, within the temple, oh, by the way, this is also true in Buddhist temples. The image of the Buddha is there, and everything is given, offered to the image of the Buddha. And what, what is that? How does that go? Well, in every temple I've ever been in, there is offered food, water. Almost every temple uses incense. Almost every temple uses fire as an offering. Now, what is this really? Well, if we look into the symbolism, what we're doing is actually worshiping God by offering his creation, the elements, back to him. And of course, in Upadesha Undiyar, or Upadesha Sara, Bhagavan Sri Ramana says, we can worship God in eight forms. And what are they? The five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, the sun and moon, and the jiva, the self, the consciousness. So what we're doing when we worship God is actually taking these elements and offering them back to him. For example, in India, when we worship the holy river, the Ganga, how do we do it? We literally take the river water and offer it back to the river. And how do we worship in the temple? Well, we begin with incense, isn't it? Incense is scent, and scent is the proxy or the quality of earth. So what we're really doing is offering the earth element back to God. And similarly, the water element, huh? Also fire, directly in the form of a lamp, and indirectly in the form of the form of the deity and of the worshiper, because form is the sense proxy for light. Without light, we can't see forms. So all of the offerings in the temple are of one element or another. Well, how about ether? Ether, or akash, is actually space. Nothing can exist without space. We have to have space to have anything. <laughs> Where are you going to put it <laughs> without space? Without space, it's just an idea. But with space, then we can have actual matter or energy. Both require space. So what is the proxy quality of space? Sound. So in every temple I've ever been in, the worship is accompanied by sound vibration of some kind or other. Either a bell, uh, ringing a bell, or a conch shell or some kind of horn that's blown in the beginning. Some kind of a hymn or mantra. Uh, some kind of sound vibration. So all the elements are there, all the five elements and their proxies. In fact, in Hindu temples, even air is offered in the form of a fan. Uh, so these elements are offered to God. Well, what about the sun and moon? The sun and moon are devas. They're, in other words, uh, expansions of God for controlling and regulating the material universe, the world. The sun and moon, if you study Jyotish and astrology, the sun and moon control everything and everybody. They provide the timing signals by which all the activities and all the energies in the universe are synchronized. So the sun and moon as devas are another type of proxy for God. But what about the jiva? Well, in our Advaita teaching, 
in our philosophy. The jiva is simply a reflection of God in the limited mind and body of the individual. The example is given in the rainy season, like now, last night it just rained. And after the rain, there are innumerable little puddles everywhere, here and there. Huh? Every little footprint of a goat even is a puddle. And then the clouds part and the moon comes out. It's very beautiful. And in each and every puddle, there's a reflection of the same moon. It's like suddenly there are millions of moons. So how is that? Because each of those moons is only a reflection. It's not the real thing. It's not the original. It doesn't have all the qualities of the original, but it still follows the same pattern, the same form, isn't it? So in that way, every individual living being reflected in a mind and body has many similarities, many of the same qualities as the original self. So the best offering to the actual self of all, God, Brahman, uh, or the self with a capital S, is to offer ourselves. This is bhakti. Because to offer oneself to another is the highest form of love. But you know, there's a problem with each of these offerings. Because each of these offerings is matter or energy, physical stuff. They all suffer from three defects. And the Buddha called them anicca, dukkha, anatta. Anicca means impermanent. They're temporary. They come and go. They exist for some time and then they disappear. So that's not very nice. <laughs> and dukkha, dukkha besides meaning suffering, means imperfection, unsatisfactoriness. Right? And finally, anatta means not self. All these things that we can offer, including our limited body and mind, are not the self. So they aren't really satisfactory offerings. Well, what are we doing in ordinary life? Because we are actually the self. We are actually the consciousness. Huh? We are actually the absolute, just a reflection. But still, that's all we are. Just like the reflection of the moon in the puddle is nothing but the moon, but it's still only a reflection. Nevertheless, what we're doing is we are living in a temple called the body, the body and mind. And we're offering all these sense experiences. Huh? For example, light is the energy or the object of sight. So sight is, again, a proxy for fire. Without fire, there's no light. Without light, there's no sight. <laughs> so without light, without light and sight, there's no form. So when we offer beautiful forms to our consciousness, we are making an offering of light in the temple of the self. Is it starting to come together now? When we make an offering of beautiful words or beautiful sounds, music, and like that, we're making an offer, offering of akash, ether, 
to the deity of the self within, the consciousness. So each of us lives in a temple, and each of us is the high priest of a religion. And that religion consists of our offering the senses and their objects to the consciousness. But because all of these suffer from these same three defects, uh, anicca, dukkha, anatta, temporariness or impermanence, suffering, incompleteness or unsatisfactoriness, and not self, all of these offerings fall short and they don't give us, they don't give our God, our self, the full satisfaction. So we go on wandering throughout the world and from life to life looking for this satisfaction which remains elusive. Why? Because we're not really offering the proper thing to our God, to our deity, to our self. What is the proper offering for the self? The proper offering for the self. The only one which is not covered by these three defects, which is permanent, which is fully satisfactory, and which is the self, is the self itself. Once you think of it, it's totally obvious, right? I discovered this by accident one day, <laughs> sitting in the park in Mexico City, and just thinking, what a wonderful, what a marvelous, what an inconceivably wonderful thing is this consciousness. Consciousness is completely transcendent. There's nothing and no way to describe it. It's completely without qualities, yet it can reflect and perceive all qualities. It's completely without existence, and yet without it, nothing else can exist. And so on and so on. I was just thinking, how, how amazing, how wonderful this is. And I was becoming more and more blissful. And I thought about this for a long time. And I went and I studied and I tried to understand what it was. And it took me a long time. Duh. <laughs> because it's actually, once you think of it, completely obvious that the perfect offering for God, the self, consciousness, is consciousness itself, the self itself. And so when we read or hear about the self, awareness, being called I, I. This is another meaning. This is a, the real significance of I, I, is that the consciousness is offered to itself. In other words, the object of consciousness is consciousness. The object of awareness of the self is the self. And of course, this isn't an object at all. It's the subject. <laughs> so the subject being aware of itself, in other words, self-awareness, is the highest form of worship, the highest form of meditation. And of course, that meditation, that worship can go on in any condition. We don't have to be in formal meditation. We can be anywhere doing anything. We can even be asleep and we can still be aware of awareness. We can still be offering the self to the self. And if we do this, if we try it, if we experience it, we find it's completely satisfying. 
It is completely blissful, completely perfect. So this is the real religion. This is the universal faith. We're all offering this and that to the self, to consciousness, huh? trying to find the perfect thing to offer and falling short because of the three deficiencies of everything that exists, that has being in the world. So this is the conclusion, actually, of the question which we began this series, this investigation, all oh, like seven years ago. That being in the world is not a problem. There's no suffering involved in it at all, provided we're in this consciousness of offering the self to itself. And whenever we encounter an object of the senses, realizing that the consciousness that is aware of this object is perfect, and offering that consciousness back to itself. And this is the ultimate state. This is enlightenment. This is self-realization. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam